right, well, <clears throat> good morning. It's good to see everybody today. Welcome to the nice, cool indoors. Uh, my name is Frank. I'll be with you today. Um, Brad and Elfie are traveling for the next month. Um, and so, actually, Brad emailed me on Friday. He wanted to give me an update um, on some of the information he gave you uh, last week as well. Uh, he's, he wanted to let you know that they appreciate the many well wishes and your prayers. He said, we feel so loved by our church family. This week, we really got encouraging news on the prognosis of Elfie's treatment. Um, her cancer is highly treatable and uh, will be handled through minimal evasive surgery a bit later in July. We're going to be taking a few weeks of vacation and then be back to get Elfie the treatment she needs before you miss us, which is not true. Um, <clears throat> you're in good hands, and we are grateful for your loving kindness and your prayers. So uh, please keep uh, Elfie and Brad in your prayers, and we will do that um, as they travel and get some much-needed rest and, and so forth. So you're stuck with me. <laughs> um, and uh, we're going to spend the next few weeks looking at a topic that I think is really important in our culture today. Um, it's something that's kind of like simmering maybe at the edge of our consciousness it's a topic that has been important to me and I've come back to again and again over the years. And it's this question here, in what or who do we trust? Now, maybe you've answered that at some point in your life. You know what you trust or where your trust is kind of centered. You know that. But as situations change, as your life changes and things happen, that might creep up again. It might come back as another question for you. In fact, that question is everywhere. It impacts how we see the world. It impacts how we see each other. It impacts the decisions that we make. Trust. Let me give you an example. I've got here a penny. Looks like this. I'm kidding. It's a dollar. It's worth a penny. Just kidding. But on it is written the words, in God we trust. That's right there. All of our American currency in God we trust. But do we believe it? Does that phrase, in God we trust, does it impact how we spend this dollar? Just a thought. Because this question of trust is kind of everywhere. And so we're going to explore four as uh, aspects of trust over the next few weeks. And today we're going to start with one of those. It's my favorite one. It's one I'm most familiar with, I guess. And that is... Science. I've always enjoyed science. So even when I was a little kid, I, I liked math classes and physics classes. You can say I gravitated toward science. Um, let's give me four weeks of this. Just hang in there. Um, it's why I prefer Star Trek over Star Wars. Yeah, because Star Trek has got engineers, Scotty, LaForge, Trip Tucker, right? Just actual engineers. What's Star Wars got? A Wookiee, like banging on stuff with a wrench. That's not science. That's not engineering. That's just crazy talk, right? So for me, it was Star Trek. Now, again, for me, growing up, it was just such a foundational thing, science. It was just such a, everything kind of fit for me in that world. But more recently, in the last three or four years, I've seen this kind of shift in how we talk about science. And it's really, to be honest, it's bothered me. It's been troublesome for me. Even I would go as far as to say it's dangerous. And we've kind of got this phrase floating around in our culture right now that I find troublesome. It's this one right here. Trust the science. That has really bothered me. And I want to spend some time talking about that today. But to do that, I got to give you some of my background just to be fair, maybe get to know each other a little bit. So I grew up, and this is a surprise, I grew up in the 70s and 80s, okay, when video games look like this. <laughs> look at those graphics. That is sharp black and white, baby, right? Asteroids, yeah? Um, I also grew up in a time when the space program was rocketing along. Uh, yeah, see, that's two. Um, <laughs> right, yeah, yeah the, the Apollo program. The space shuttle was just getting kicked off. It was, it was a cool time. And so I took a lot of classes in science and math and all those things that really interested me. Again, because it was foundational. When I graduated high school, I went to Purdue University in West Lafayette, Indiana. Not because of the football team. They're awful. I went there because this guy went there, Neil Armstrong. 
and I wanted to be an aerospace engineer. What better place to go than where that guy went to school? In fact, a lot of, of astronauts have gone to Purdue over the years. And that's also at Purdue where I met my amazing, beautiful wife, Stacy. So we get married after graduation and we move across the country to Los Angeles um, where I took a job at Hughes Aircraft Company designing spacecraft. Kind of a cool job to start off right out of college. I was pretty excited about that. In fact, one of the programs I worked on early on was this one. Um, we designed structure to bring that satellite back to Earth in the cargo bay of the space shuttle. Think it's complicated launching a satellite? Try bringing one back. It was a cool, cool job. And I loved it and I had a knack for it because it made sense to me. Like you look at environments and materials and what you need to do and then you design something and then you test that thing and you test it again and you verify it and then you launch it into space. It made sense. And we never trusted anything. I'm an engineer today. We don't trust anything. We verify everything. I never knew a scientist that said, trust me. Like, you don't go to an astronaut and say, hey, buddy, get up on that big, huge bomb we just built. Trust me, it's going to work. You don't do that, right? You verify, you test, you make sure that it's going to work. And even then, there are failures and things like of that nature. Now, skipping ahead a few years, Stace and I became, my wife and I, became followers of Jesus. <clears throat> and so I began to ask a different set of questions in my life. Ones that weren't so provable. I listened to sermons, read the Bible, and I'm like, like how, how do I know that's true? How do I trust that? Now, not that the preachers weren't trustworthy, but for me, I wanted to know. I wanted to verify, bring an engineering right to the Bible. I'm like, how do I know this? And those questions kind of burned within me. And so I began to take Bible classes at a college down the street during my lunch hour. You know what I found out in those Bible college classes? I didn't know anything. I knew so little. And so, and this is, again, major credit to my wife and her faithfulness for this. We sold our home took our small family and moved to Tennessee so I can go to seminary. And after that, we moved to Atlanta so I could continue my graduate studies in theology at Emory University and then later University of Georgia for historical linguistics, the languages of the Bible. And I still, as I studied, I'm like, gosh, there's still so much I don't know and I don't understand and I kept on digging and studying. You know what else I found out? And then all those graduate hours, Science was not as firm and foundational as I thought. There are a lot of unknowns in science, too. In fact, anybody hear, hear of uh, Goitel's incompleteness theorem? Just kidding, just kidding. Yeah, it's, it's incomplete. Who cares, right? No. Goitel, in 1931, has this theorem that any system, any system you come up with, will have some element of untruth to it or something that doesn't fit within that system. You with me? Like, make a most complex system, something won't fit. That's goidal. Take mathematics, for example. It's pretty simple. Math is foundational. One plus one is two, right? Put negative one and do the square root in your calculator, see what you get. You know what it says? Error. Because it's not real. The I we use to represent that in mathematics, that I, means imaginary. Can you imagine having something in math that's imaginary? Like, who thought of that? Now, just because it's not real or it's imaginary does not mean it's not useful. In fact, it's how I met my wife. Really, look. <laughs> it worked. She's married to me. Right? 30 plus years. But the thing is, it's frustrating because I thought what was so foundational for me was like all of a sudden, like, okay, now I got questions about that too. There's this uncertainty. And here's the key that uncertainty of science is baked into science, it's part of what it is. Science is not a thing that you trust. You know what science is? It's a tool. 
It's a tool to study and begin to try to comprehend this amazing, complex, beautiful, intricate, big, small world that we live in. It's simply a tool. In fact, you know what, where science got its start? Not the university. You know where it started? In a church. The church came up with science. In the 13th century, Roger Bacon, awesome name, by the way, it was an English minister. He was an English minister, and he was the first to outline what we call today the scientific method. Observation, hypothesis, test, right? Experimentation, conclusion, and then you do it all again. But you do it in a way that someone else can do it themselves. You don't say, hey, I did this, trust me. No, you say, here's what I did. Here's how I did it and exactly how I did it so you can go do it yourself. It was never about trust. It was like, I have a question. I want to know how this works. I'm going to explore it because guess what? God made it. And if I can study it, I can learn something about God. Aquinas, same time period, 13th century. He said this, consequently, a man takes the greatest pleasure in those things which he discovers for himself or learns from the ground up. He said, look, I look at the world, he said. It's a huge laboratory. God made all this stuff, so if I study what he made, I can learn something about him. The Apostle Paul, writing to the church in Rome, so first century, he, he talked to the people in Rome and he said, you know what, everybody on the planet, everybody, is without excuse. When it comes to knowing God, everybody, he said, everybody, can know the invisible, divine nature of God. How? By the things God has made. Paul said that. That's what the church was doing. It was studying what God had made in order to learn more about God. In fact, it's kind of like reverse engineering. You know what that is? It's where companies will take something and they'll take it apart to figure out who made it, how they made it, what they know. So you reverse it. You take it apart and figure it out. It's kind of like that with creation. My son, Jacob, this is his jam, right? He's my oldest son, Jacob. He's always liked to take things apart and try to figure things out. When he was a kid, I would give him old computers and like, here, he'd take it apart and spend all day just looking at stuff and how things worked. It's how his mind works. In fact, when our youngest son was born, Jacob was three. So we put Jacob in the bed with his mom and like took his little baby brother and you put him in Jacob's lap. You know, know what he does? He has thumbs like mine. Like, okay. He has fingers like mine. He's, he's just poking and pulling and figuring this thing out. This is his brother, right? Finally, he says to Stacy, does he talk? <laughs> and Stacy's like, no, no, he doesn't talk. But he squeaks. Make him squeak. <laughs> you know, You're like, I want to verify the information you're giving me here. See, I can say this maybe without malice, but I don't think engineers create anything. Again, I'm an engineer, so I'm talking about myself here. I don't think we create anything. You know what we do? We observe. We look at the stuff that God made. We study it, find repeatable patterns, and turn it into something that we can use. That's what we do. We don't make anything. We just repurpose stuff that God's already made. In fact, there's a great story. One of my favorite stories is uh, about this guy right here, 1941, uh, Dave Mestrel, who was out with his dog hunting, yeah? He's out there walking in the woods, and he gets those little cockle burrs on his socks. You ever got those? Like jumping choya, but not so much. Like it's on his socks. And so he's, the afternoon, he's out there picking these things off his socks, which is like super annoying, right? And he takes that frustration and channels it into positive energy. And he develops a piece of cloth that on one side has got um, little, little loops and it's soft like velvet, yeah? The other piece of cloth, he puts little hooks on, little plastic hooks, like, like crochet needles. So this velvet loop side and this little hook side with these little, that looks like crochet needles. He puts them together and they stick but if he had sheer force, they pull apart and they stick. 
and they pull apart. He made Velcro. Velvet, crochet, Velcro, right? How? He didn't invent it. He just took what God did and just kind of put it on people's shoes, yeah? So it's something different like that that we do. We have this beautiful opportunity to study what God's done. Now, that being said, science is a tool. It's a tool, part of your toolkit that you get to use to explore the world. Not the only tool, right? If you go to the dentist, right? let's say today, tomorrow, got a dentist appointment, get a cavity drilled out, I know, pleasant thought on a Sunday. And you're sitting there and you're like, you know, praying that the Novocaine's really taking hold. And the dentist goes, oh my goodness, my drill broke. What am I gonna do? Oh, I know. I'll go to the Home Depot. I'm going to buy a new DeWalt hammer drill. I'll be right back. How many of you are staying? Like, I'm not staying. That's the wrong tool for the job. Well, science is a tool, not the only tool. And science can help us a lot. So, like, take, for example, birds, right? Birds sing, make noise. And science can study those birds and say, this is how they make noise. This is how they sing. And they may sing for mating purposes, but you know what science can't tell you? Why it is in the morning and the sun's just coming up and you're out with your cup of coffee and you can hear birds singing, it can't tell you why that sounds beautiful to you. It's a different question. It needs different tools. Or take technology. You got a phone with you somewhere nearby, you in your pocket nearby. Amazing technology. It's got a library on it. Photos, communication device, information source, all this amazing stuff in your phone. But it can't give you information about how to use it, what to look at, what not to look at, when it is that it's beginning to destroy relationships because it's become an addiction. It's not what it's for. It's a different tool. And there's a certain point to where we have to go from what science gives us and leap to the God questions, the moral questions. There's a, there's a leap there. John Polkinghorne was a physicist. This is him right here, a world-renowned physicist. And uh, he was kind of like on the level of like Einstein, Niels Bohr, studying quantum mechanics and stuff like that. Excuse me. And uh, so he's studying this stuff, and he begins to see in quantum mechanics what he called the fingerprints of God. He sees these intricate things. He's like, gosh, something, someone made this. And I want to know more, but I can only go so far with my science. You know what he did? He became an Anglican priest. Went to seminary and began studying things about God's revelation and who this God that creates like this. He writes in that world, even to, um, in later in his life. <coughs> Excuse me. So, um, the next few minutes, and by the way, let me say this. A lot of people even today, they want to kind of separate out science and theology. Like, you have science questions, and then you have theology questions, and the two should never talk to each other. They're unrelated. Not true. Science was created in the church to learn about God. Theological questions kind of take it the next step, but they go together. So let's have some fun. It's, it's the summertime. Have some fun with Science, yeah? Come on. Yeah. It's, yeah, it's science, it's fun. You're like, oh my goodness. All right. <laughs> what is the closest star to the earth? The sun, okay? It is 93 million miles away, which means if it blew up right now, it would take eight minutes for you to even find out, okay? It is a million times bigger than the earth. So you are here, that's the sun. So if the, sun, if the earth was a golf ball, was this big, the sun would be about the size of the room. Okay, that's, that's huge, right? That's, that's big. But the sun is like an eh kind of star. It's not the biggest star by any stretch of the imagination. One of the biggest stars we know about is this one, Betelgeuse. Okay? It's one of the biggest stars we know. It is, it is six trillion miles from earth. So, like, national debt size from Earth, okay? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, it's six trillion miles from Earth. That means that if you wanted to go there on your summer vacation, you know, pack the kids into the minivan, drive 70 miles an hour to get the Beetlejuice, 
you would need snacks for 10 million years to get there. That's how far away it is. How big is it? 262 trillion times the size of Earth. That means that if the Earth was a golf ball, you could take as many golf balls as would fill Dodger Stadium 3,000 times to get as a Beetlejuice. Dodger Stadium. I know you look confused. I said golf balls, not goof balls. <laughs> goof balls what they put in Dodger Stadium most every day. <laughs> so I just want to clear that up. Golf balls. All right. Now, that being said, this massive star, all these stars, what does theology say about that? Well, Psalm 147, verse 4 says this. God determines the number of the stars. He gives to all of them their names, which is not surprising. He made them all. He's probably got names for them all. But verse 3, right before that, this is what it says. He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. Right? The same God that made all that stuff, who's in charge of Betelgeuse, the sun, all these planets, all these stars, he cares about you and your broken heart and your pain. He cares about that. That's something I can trust. But the God of the universe cares about you. Now, let's go the other direction, okay? Let's say we go small. So here I have got a grapefruit, okay? So this is full of atoms, one of the smallest parts of our creation. Not the smallest, but small. So if I took an atom and made it the size of a blueberry... Okay, so I blew the atoms up in this grapefruit that has the blueberry. How big would the grapefruit become? The size of the earth. That's how many atoms are in this, you know, poor old grapefruit here. Amazing, yeah? Now, let's say I take that, that uh, atom and I blow it up again until it's the size of that kind of jiffy pop looking structure down in Glendale we call Phoenix Stadium. Right? It's like, because little like Jiffy Pop to you, like just like a Jiffy Pop thing. Okay, we blow it up, right? Now, you probably learned in like middle school, high school, uh, go back one for a second, thanks, um, that atoms look like this, or they're modeled like this, right? You got a nucleus in the middle with protons and neutrons, and that middle carries almost all of the mass of the atom, right? It's, 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 most of its weight is in the middle, and around it, are these electrons just spinning and buzzing around in little clouds, just shh, right? So let's say I take my atom, make it the size of Cardinal Stadium, right? How big is the nucleus in the middle, do you think? Go, ahead, go, ahead, go to the Cardinal's one for a second. Okay, so how big in that stadium is the nucleus? It's the size of a marble, Think about that. The, the, the mass, the most of the mass of the atom is the size of a marble on the 50-yard line. The electrons are spinning around the outside of the stadium. What does that mean? That means that most of creation, most of you, most of me, most of everything in an atom is as empty as the Cardinal Stadium in the playoffs. It's true. Like there's, like, there's like a lot of empty space in every single atom inside of you and me. We're mostly empty space. It's kind of weird, right? But now take that and take a look at what, what Paul says in 1 Corinthians. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, which you have from God? Like literally God lives within you. And guess what? Apparently there's plenty of space for God to live in the midst of his creation. One more thing. You, yeah? You have 100 million, 100 trillion, sorry, 100 trillion cells inside of you right now. 100 trillion cells. Did you know that every 20 seconds, three times every minute, 20 billion of those cells are going to die and have to be replaced? Every 20 seconds, 20 billion of your cells die and are replaced, which is why you're tired all the time. <laughs> it's kind of amazing. In fact, over your lifetime, you will leave 44, this is crazy, it kind of grosses me out, but you'll leave 44 pounds of skin flakes laying around everywhere over your lifetime. 
which is why you got to dust a lot. It's just kind of nuts, right? We think about how much is going on right now in your body. You know what Jesus says about that? Matthew 10, even the hairs in your head are counted. Like with all that going on, God still knows about you. It's amazing this laboratory we live in to learn about God. So let's do some lab work. Psalm 19 says this, the heavens are telling the glory of God and the firmament proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours forth speech and night to night declares knowledge. There is no speech nor are there words. Their voice is not heard, yet their voice goes out through all the earth and their words to the end of the world. Are you paying attention? Am I paying attention to this amazing, incredible, finely tuned, precise, big, small world that God has made? Because God has left his fingerprints everywhere for you and I. If you just take a look at them, let me give you one more example. This is cool. You ever heard of Fibonacci? Love Fibonacci, right? He had a sequence. Here's the sequence, right? One. One plus one is? You're brilliant, all right? Now take the last number you just made, two, add it to one, you get? Take the last number you had, three plus two is? Five plus three is? Now you guys, now look at your calculator. I'm a calculator. No, I'm just kidding. Right, you just keep going like that, right? You keep, that, that's the sequence. Number before, new number, number before, keep going like that, right? If I were to graph this, it looks like this. Okay, I got one, one, two, three, five, and so forth. Now, if I take that and I connect the corners, I get a spiral called Fibonacci spiral based on Fibonacci's number. Where is the spiral seen? Everywhere. Take a look. Shells, flowers, hurricanes, the spiraling galaxies, your ear. Right? This Fibonacci spiral kind of God's like planted all over the place. Like, do you see me yet? See my fingerprints? Someone did this. You paying attention? Right? And I love that. That God has like left himself these beautiful little moments, these beautiful little fingerprints for us to explore and to see and be amazed by. But not just be like, wow, that's really cool. That's a great start. But then to say, who creates like this? And not only that, why? Why does God create like this? Why did God make all of this? From Beetlejuice to the atom to the quanta, Everything. Why does God do this? Well, I think we have an answer. I think Jesus gives us an answer. Maybe not directly, but kind of. One day Jesus was asked by a lawyer a question. And the question was this. Teacher, which commandment in the law is the greatest? I know it's not the exact question I'm asking, but it kind of says, like, what's my purpose why am I here? What does God want from me? Why is all this happening? What is the bottom line? What's the greatest commandment? Like, what's God want? Jesus answers him. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There it is. So now, put that in context. All of creation right now, spinning galaxies, atoms, the 20 seconds, you just replaced 20 billion cells in your body, all that stuff's going on for this purpose. Do you love God? And do you love your neighbor, which Brad talked about last week? How are you gonna leave this place and treat the person at Home Depot, the person who cuts you off in traffic, how are you going to treat your friends, neighbors, coworkers? Guess what? Because the entire universe is like, yeah, we're watching. God created us so you'd have the opportunity to love him and love others. That's what all this wraps down to. In fact, at the end of the world, when the world ends, you know what God's not going to ask you? He's not going to look at you and say, hey, give me the gravitational constant. How far away is Beetlejuice? No, he's not. You know he's going to ask you what's going to happen? It says in Matthew um, 25 that on that day, 
when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all his angels with him, it says he will sit on the throne of his glory and all the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will say to those on his, he put the sheep on his right hand and he put the goats on his left. And then he'll say to those on his right hand, and get this, come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom that was prepared for you since the creation of the world. All of this, when it all was created, this kingdom was prepared for you. Why? Because I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you took care of me. I was in prison and you visited me. And the righteous will answer him, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry and gave you food or thirsty and gave you something to drink? When was it that we saw you as a stranger and welcomed you or naked and clothed you? When was it that we saw you sick or in prison and we visited you? And the king will answer them, truly I tell you, just as you've done it to one of the least of these members of my family, You've done it to me. And that right there is something that every single one of us can trust. Would you pray with me? Lord Jesus, I am simply amazed by your creation, blown away by the intricacy and the detail the size and the smallness, the precision and the perfection of what you've made. But even more than that, I'm amazed by the fact that you care so deeply about us. You bind up our broken hearts. You know how many hairs are on our heads. You've prepared a place for us. And you've called us to love you and to love others. Thank you for all that you've done. And I pray this week that we continue to look at your world and just amazed and grateful for who you are. We pray you be with Brad and Elfie as well as they travel, watch over them, bring healing and peace. We pray all these things in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Would you please stand for a little bit? Thanks. So as you go out your week, may the Lord bless and keep every one of you. May his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May he lift up his countenance upon you and give you true peace. So go in peace, have an amazing week, and enjoy the world around you.